anyone who watches my videos knows that I live in a micro home or I don't know it's 495 square feet of micro home I think it is because it's a fully detached house but it's small uh, and my computer is in the same room that is my laundry room and it's a laundry room slash utility room slash workshop slash exercise room slash bookshelves slash everything uh, a house that I've often said belongs more in the Netherlands than or in Japan than in Canada where we're not starved for space but anyway there's laundry hanging there <laughs> in case anyone is wondering um, we do that for a reason actually where I live it's um, horrifically cold I think yesterday it went down to minus 45 centigrade or something like this when it gets that cold all the moisture gets frozen out of the air and your lips start to crack even when you're inside uh, and your um, cuticles get all ragged and everything um, and the old timers used to just hang the laundry inside to humidify the air and we've taken to doing that and I'm just too lazy this morning to uh, move it all or to blot it out with my usual uh, canopy in the background so anyway I don't know if anyone cares about that but I just thought I'd say that um, I won't say that I'm sort of stalled here in my series of um, I'm exploring Tantra, which is kind of branched out from my Atheism versus India Revisited series, which I still want to get at. Um, but Tantra is such a massive distraction for my mind, because in as much as I have a passion for anything, um, I'm not really the most passionate person out there, some Irishman, eh? um, I have an extreme uh, interest in Tantra. Uh, Tantra has kind of become the closest thing I have to a life philosophy, I guess. But it's Tantra that's, you know, welded all kinds of things which really aren't technically related, like <laughs> Nietzsche and, um, and uh, you know, pop culture and all this kind of thing. In other words, it's kind of, it's become kind of the prism through which I see absolutely everything. We all have these prisms, by the way. And in a sense, Tantra is, is just a way or just one label one can place on studying the prism through which we, we all look. I mentioned yesterday the uh, life denial type um, prism where reality is seen as horrible or undesirable. Um, as in Zafi, you perceive reality for what it actually is and you go mad. Uh, you go mad at how horrible it is. Um, in the Gita, in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Arjuna almost goes mad uh, with just sensory overload. It isn't so much that it's bad what he sees when he sees the Vishvarupa, the universal form that Krishna shows him. It's just that it's too intense. He can't take it. As I mentioned in a couple of other videos, the intensity of feeling that you get when you practice Hatha Yoga, or even, I guess, when you get into, you know, more cerebral things, I guess, like meditation, mantra meditation, the intensities that you feel are often a little bit overwhelming. And again, I always say, if it gets too intense, withdraw, pull back. Because, um, you know, you might not be ready for whatever you're going to come across in there. Uh, it might not be your um, thing yet. You might not be quite prepared to find out what I don't know, your version of Sauron looks like. You might not be prepared to find out or to face your own version of Orwell's Room 101, which is the worst thing in the world, because we all have the worst thing in the world, and the worst thing in the world is already in here. It's already ready for someone to use against you, I guess. And, you know, you get syndromes or conditions like anxiety, where I think it's essentially someone is trying not to face something inside of themselves. Um, and all of that are dangers when you're trying to actually manipulate your own experiences. There are enormous landmines to step on, I guess, um, when you're exploring your inner life, when you're exploring the experience of being in existence from the inside, not from somebody watching somebody else experience something, but you actually experiencing everything. <laughs> Um, where you are not just in the driver's seat, I keep using the Cartesian theater metaphor, but it's not just you are the driver, but you're the driver and you're the car. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a 
it's a mind fuck, really, I guess, is the way that you would put it, and you're doing it to yourself. Um, in much the same way as being a life denier is the same kind of mind game that you're playing. Because what you're doing is you're employing your will, voluntarily or not. Again, I, I'm agnostic when it comes to will being free or not. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, and I don't know how one can be sure. But anyway, that's another thread, I guess. Um, when you when you get an individual who is in a state of depression, I believe well, this is just my own musings, and you know I have a depressive streak in my personality, um, and I always analyze it once it's passed, and I try to analyze it while I'm in it, but it's not always easy to do that because you're you know you, it's just total chaos up there, uh, so you know you end up just laying down on the couch and waiting for it to go away. Um, terrifying feeling, actually, believe it or not. You think that that's easy. Okay, I'm just depressed. I'll wait for it to go away. Well, that assumes that <laughs> you... Um, that assumes that you are sure that it will go away. <laughs> uh, and it, one of the things about depression is that certainty is absent. You don't believe that you'll ever, you'll ever get better. But anyway, it's just that I think that there is an element of will involved when it comes to things like depression, when it comes to things like life denial, because um, your will is intervening to alter your perceptions, or something is altering your perceptions to make them appear purely negative. And not just negative in a, in a you know, just a positive negative paradigm where we don't really place value on positive or negative, but negative in a malignant kind of cancerous, um, hostile kind of negative, as in, you know, what, what we would might call conventionally or ridiculously overstatedly evil. Um, it's, it's not a nice negativity, whereas there is pleasant negation. Ask a Zen Buddhist. Um, if you want to void out the entire universe, it can be rather nice, um, if you do it correctly with the proper discipline of mind and everything. A mystic of the Sands wrote a very good poem um, called Amor Vacui, love of the void. One of my favorite terms is horror vacui, because fear of the void is, it seems to be quite prevalent among people of a philosophical bent, because you learn how to gaze into that abyss that Nietzsche says, careful, because the abyss gazes back into you, which it does. <laughs> um, a certain amount of projection of the will has to be uh, employed in order to change a world that really has no inherent value into it, in it into a completely negative thing and a malignant negativity. Um, depression, uh, anxiety, um, sort of states where you don't really see any value in them. You don't see any good value, I guess I would call it. It's not something that you would seek under any circumstances. However, as I say, I'm not sure that the will is free. The will may do things, and it may not be under your own control. It may not be under the control of that which expresses the will. Um, so it goes to places, and it turns your reality into something horrible. Um, Tantra says you can reverse that process, or at least stand that process on its head, and engage the will in order to change your perceptions into something good. Now, th we have evidence that you can actually do this um, in everyday life. I have a little boy um, who's, you may hear in the background, wailing away. He's actually not crying. He just likes to blah, 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 as babies will. And in a couple of years, his, what we would call childhood imagination, is going to kick in. He's going to watch cartoons. He's going to listen to nursery rhymes and get an enormous kick out of it all. Um, that's just what babies or toddlers do. Why is that? Why is the same thing when you, you know, recite Jack and Jill went up the hill to a little kid? They get this rush of joy, or they sometimes do, whereas an adult goes, whatever. I would say that it's because we have attempted to harness our will, um, or we have attempted to, in the process, I guess, of, of civilizing ourselves, if you're civilizing, if you want to say that, we've had to sort of mold our characters in a certain way and say that um, now it's time to take this life thing very seriously and forget about the frivolities that we learned in the cradle. 
you have to, I think, somehow intervene to get people out of that state. Somehow intervene to get people out of the state where um, little things have enormous value. You know, as you get older, you get more jaded, I guess, is what I'm saying. Now, why is that? Why do we get more jaded? Why do we get more, I don't know, negative about the world? If just by virtue of having gotten older, um, the magic of childhood goes away as you learn at, you know, your, your Christmases, the diminishing value that you have every morning when you wake up and look at your toys and, wow, this is, doesn't seem as great as it did last year. Well, there's a reason for that. You're not the same person as you were last year, and you're a little bit more cynical and a little bit more suspicious of this world thing that you wholeheartedly believed in. Or one could say that you didn't really believe in any of it, but you projected your own desires onto it, your own desires to see good, and now you're seeing that it's just a place where good will not come at you. Um... Or good will not come at you unbidden the way that it used to when you were younger. You have to consciously bring this about. Well, as I say, in, in my experience, depression was somewhat a loss of control over the horses that the charioteer has. Depression was when the horses each, you know, led, I use the metaphor of, of a charioteer here, which is taken straight out of the Gita, um, the Bhagavad Gita, where... The charioteer is in charge of his senses. The senses are the horses. It's an elaborate metaphor, really elaborate metaphor. But anyway, um, depression and anxiety seem to be when the horses are doing whatever they want, irrespective of what the charioteer wants. You have to engage the will. Didn't say it was free will, but you have to engage that force that's out there called the will in order to help you control those horses. Because the will... The will seems to have a will of its own. <laughs> um, your own will seems to fight a certain part of you. I want to see positive, but I see negative. What's going on here? <laughs> you know, um, it's um, it's an interesting thing engaging the will, engaging the will to power, the will to meaning, the will to life, the will to um, answers. <laughs> the will to joy, the will to ecstasy, whatever you want to call it. Um, Tantra, in particular, is big on ecstasy. It even says that the ecstasy that you do get out of advanced practice of Tantra is a better ecstasy than anything else. But, of course, every school of yoga says that. <laughs> the Gita says that bhakti, un unconditional love of God in the universe, is you know the best. So, take your pick. But the long and the short of it is, um, the will seems to be involved. The will is either um, not being used to the advantage of the advantage of the that which has a will. <laughs> I don't want to say the I or the me or the personality or the mind or whatever. Although mind seems to be the easiest one for us to swallow, so I'll just say mind. The mind is not engaging the will, or the will will not be engaged. The will wants to go to the negative place. But, but I want the will to go to the positive place. What wants the will to go to the positive place? You see, you get this sort of strange interlocking series of wills inside of yourself. Um, but you can... The will can intervene, the mind can intervene, or the manipulation of perception can have the effect of turning the universe into a good or a bad place. Um, that's why it's awkward to sort of say that somebody who's depressed is wrong and is not seeing what's actually there. Um, I say that, yes, you're not actually seeing what's actually there, but not that what you're seeing isn't real. What you're perceiving isn't real if you're depressed. What you're perceiving is real. But the problem is, of course, you're blotting out all the other stuff which is there as well which is just as much of a danger as if you go too far into the how wonderful life is because you're setting yourself up for the most horrific fall imaginable. We all know what it is to have puppy love in junior high when you're madly in love with this uh, young girl and she rejects you because you were absolutely certain that this was going to work out for you and uh, it was going to turn you into the happiest individual in the universe and that was one of the life lessons um, that you get early in life. Having your 
hopes crushed. Having your unrealistic hopes crushed because you've decided that the universe is absolutely wonderful and all you need is that curly-haired girl and everything is wonderful. That's, you know, that's puppy love. That's sort of irresponsible hooray for everything, a la um, Ned Flanders. Um, the universe is both, I suppose, or up here is both. How do we so engineer our experiences that we avoid that which is toxic to us and cleave to that which is healthy for us? What is it that makes Christmas for a child very pleasant and could be um, a natural state because you're young and you're less influenced by the world and as you get older Christmas becomes more of a pain in the neck for a lot of people myself included I don't like Christmas um, what is that that happens what is it that takes place it's the same thing it's the same world why does it get sort of cheaper as you get older do you forget something do you become too caught up in the negativity of the world, which something in you says shouldn't be there? <laughs> um, it's there, whether you like it or not. Some people are, I guess, they end up in a state of somewhat despairing anxiety, saying that, oh my God, I have to deal with this, and this is just part and parcel of reality, and anything is better than this. So, you know, you get the Janes who say, just cut out of all of this because it's all horrible. <laughs> Although I, I'm sure that a lot of Janes would completely disagree with me. They would just say it only looks horrible from your point of view, which I agree with, actually. Um, but the main thing is, though, of course, is the loss of your ability to manipulate your experiences. When you're stuck in a depression, you can't manipulate your way out of it. When you're hopelessly and unrealistically happy, and you're just waiting, or, you know, reality is just waiting, apparently, to smash you to atoms, you, it, you're equally, you've lost control of the situation. It's like if you, you know, load your nostrils with cocaine and decide you're going to be glum. It's not going to happen. Um, because you've done things which have prevented you from controlling your own experiences. Um, this is a another disjointed ramble. I just basically started to sort of explain why I'm getting sort of going off in different directions here when I meant to stay on topic. I guess simply because I've gotten into something that I'm personally interested in. Um, oh, I'll, also, I'll say that I haven't been very good at keeping up with comments. Um, I'm usually very good, but repetitive strain injury, I'm trying to avoid using the keypad. So I'm making longer videos to try and cover the stuff that's come up in the comments, just so people know. I'm usually quite diligent. In fact, I try to answer every single comment as it comes up. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll get back to atheism versus India after this wonderful jaunt into Tantra. <laughs>